What's the difference between an assistant, an associate, and a full professor? Stick around and find out today on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up, everybody? My name is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh, and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to progress your career in academia. As always, I appreciate the love, so please do take a moment to like and share this video with your friends, with your students, with your colleagues. Subscribe to our channel and hit that bell to be able to make sure that anytime we post new videos, you get a notification. And also, comment below. Per usual, you can follow us via these social media accounts, so please do take a moment to be able to do that. So today we're going to be discussing the most common form of the academic ladder found in North America, which is assistant, associate, and full professorship. This is usually what's referred to as the tenure track, because there's other kinds of being a professor. You could be an adjunct professor, which means that you essentially are a contractor. You come in, you know, you're teaching a one or a few classes, but it's usually not your full-time gig. Even though there are people who just teach, you know, adjuncting courses across multiple universities to make their salary. There's also a clinical professor, usually meaning that you're working in some kind of a practicum setting, and if you are giving workshops and such, it's not in the context of kind of a normal faculty member, you're not going to get tenure or anything like this. And then you've got research professors where usually they're getting compensated not by you know teaching and by students and tuition, but rather by grants and they're working on those grants. Now, some universities do make it so that you still have some kind of a tenure track process for research professors, but it is comparatively rare. And remember that tenure track positions are at pretty much an all-time low. Adjuncting positions are are hugely on the rise, and the reason is that most universities, they're really concerned about money, and being an ad, hiring an adjunct is way cheaper than a tenure track person, right? So, the other thing that I want to mention before giving you the differences is that even though this is what you see in North America, doesn't mean that this is what you're going to see in Europe, in Australia, in Africa, in South America, etc. Uh, the reason that I mention it is that I've lived in you know five different countries, and no matter where I've been, be it in Asia, or in you know the UK or Switzerland or Germany, you know you see different things everywhere. So, for example, if you're in Germany, you've got this concept of habilitation and a you know professor docent. So this docent concept you'll see it in Spain and other countries. Uh, in the UK, you've got you know a totally different structure. When I was at Oxford, you know you would have lecturers, fellows, readers, and professors. I made huge mistakes in the UK when I moved there. When you know you would just see somebody who's a professor, I mean, they're you know the top rank, and I would say, yeah, Dr. Johnson, I hope you're having a good day. Oh, they complained to my supervisor about it. And then I would have people who were not professors, they were, let's say, readers, and I would call them professor. Hey, Professor Johnson, they felt so disrespected by me. They thought I was kind of making fun of them. Oh, you're not at the top rank, ha ha ha. And of course, the professor that I called a doctor, it's like, oh, he's disrespecting me, he thinks that I'm lower than I am. To me, I mean, at the time, I, when I was in, in school, in Boston for undergrad, I would just call everybody, you know, synonyms for me, doctor and professor and this kind of stuff. But they take it real serious in other cultures. So you really got to make sure that in terms of your terminology, you're on point. I just got invited to be a keynote speaker in South Africa at this conference, which I'm looking forward to. But, you know, they, they made sure to say like professor in front of my name instead of doctor and everybody else who's a speaker is doctor, doctor, doctor. And then, you know, professor, you know, J. Phoenix Singh. Uh, and so it's one of these things where people take it real seriously. I personally don't take it seriously, but it's important to know that in academia, remember that the coin of the realm is like perceived respect, not actual respect, perceived respect. And this is one of those silly monikers that, you know, lends respect, right? So. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump into the differences between assistant, associate, and full professors. So level one is assistant professor. Usually you've come straight into this position from either graduate school or from some kind of a postdoc. 
and when you come into the position, you are the low man on the totem pole. Usually, you've completed a doctoral degree. There are some settings where you can become an assistant professor with just a, a master's, but usually there's certain fields where you're more likely to be able to do that. So for example, let's say you've got like an MSW, so master's in social work. You can get a doctorate in social work as well, but in order to get a licensure, unlike something like, let's say, clinical psychology, where you need a doctorate, uh, you only need a master's, right, to become uh, an LCSW, licensed clinical social worker. So it's not something where it would be kind of out of the ordinary to see somebody as, especially like a clinical professor, who has uh, only a master's degree in social work. Uh, but usually you're going to find somebody with a doctoral degree or an equivalent. And it doesn't just have to be a PhD, obviously it could be a JD, an MD, so on and so forth. When you're an assistant professor, you're not going to have tenure but your tenure clock is going to start. If you're interested in me on doing uh, in me doing a whole video on how to get tenure, best practices, how to put your materials together, etc., just let me know down in the comments below and the more upvotes that I get on it, uh, the more likely I am to be able to make that video for you guys. Uh, but usually you don't have tenure when you're starting out as an assistant professor. It's just not a thing. Usually it comes when you're an associate professor. Sometimes even then you're not getting tenure. Tenure and becoming an associate professor are technically two separate processes, but these days people kind of consider them together. Your tenure clock is usually five to six years long. Sometimes it's longer. Sometimes you can jump the gun and you can just say, you know what, after a couple of years, I'm ready. I want to be considered. Now, that's dangerous, though. It's not like you can, you know, fail your tenure and then it's like, okay, I'll just keep going and then reapply. That, that's really not how it works. Uh, the whole tenure thing, which we'll talk about in a moment, is used for a variety of gatekeeping functions. Uh, so, again, we'll talk about that in a moment, but just know that the tenure clock starts when you get this job as assistant professor, right? So you're on the clock, be aware of that. And of course, because you're low man on the totem pole, you're an early career professional in academia, you're gonna be expected to be workhorses in that department in terms of publishing, in terms of building a lab, in terms of teaching courses, uh, in terms of applying for grants, uh, especially with more senior colleagues, uh, and also serving on departmental committees, so on and so forth. You're really going to have to make a huge time and energy investment to be able to get to that next level. Again, that's that gatekeeping function of tenure. And this leads us on to level two. So level two is becoming an associate professor. An associate professor means you're not low man on the totem pole anymore and it usually comes with tenure. And really the only benefit of tenure is that you get to vote on who else gets tenure. It's not like, you know, they give you a magic wand or something and all of a sudden you have these amazing abilities. Not the case. Uh, that usually is what tenure means. Now it used to mean that the function of tenure is obviously that you have job stability and security and you can presume that you can be publishing work that's maybe a little bit more controversial and the reason you can do that is because you have that uh, increased security so if you really want to innovate and push the field forward you can do it without fear that just because your work is not seen by other colleagues to be uh, a kind of a, you're not a lemming, right? It's not just doing what everybody else is doing. That's okay, that's fine if you're kind of a bit counterculture because now you've got tenure. These days, tenure doesn't mean a whole lot. I, I'm just gonna tell you right now. Uh, I remember when I got into the game and I just thought, you know, tenure is the most important thing and once I get it, oh my gosh, I can do whatever I want. Da, da, da. Of course not. People do usually start stop working as hard, which is really unfortunate and I have seen that a lot. Uh, because the pressure's not on them anymore and they usually burn themselves out uh, during that first part of the of the process, right? Of the you know assistant to associate process. They burn out and then they, you know, they want to go on sabbatical, they want to do something to be able to, you know, do that pressure release. But uh, I've seen several times now where if somebody is very controversial or if there's, you know, student petitions and faculty position, petitions, uh, in some cases, you know, like the general public gets involved and they'll, you know, come up with uh, petitions and these things to be able to get a particular person ousted. And especially if donors, because it's all about the money, if the donors to the university, they say, you know, this person, you know, has got to go, otherwise I'm not going to give any money. These are big donors. They will consider it. And I know that sounds ridiculous but it happens. It happened at a university that I used to work at where there was a guy who's very, very controversial and he had tenure and they ousted the guy. Right? And then of course there's all these lawsuits, it gets really ugly. But all I'm trying to say is that just because you have tenure, 
doesn't necessarily mean that, hey, you're off the hook in terms of your career and these sorts of things. And obviously to get tenure, which is this gatekeeping mechanism, one of the things is that they want to kick out anybody who's not, who's kind of like a square peg in a round hole, right? And there's a variety of reasons for that. Maybe the person is on tenure track, but they're not publishing enough or high quality enough work. Uh, they have bad student evaluations that they're teaching. They're not getting any grants when that's expected in your given department. The person just, the personality is not a good fit. Doesn't necessarily mean that the person's a bad person or that they're a jerk or anything, but it just, it does not fit with the department. These are all reasons why tenure is denied. You know, I would I would like to say that personality fit in these things plays no plays no role and all. Maybe it's even something where they won't put that obviously into a report of a rejection, but they'll come up with other reasons, and that's kind of the underlying reason why they reject the tenure. Um, but if you get rejected for tenure, you don't get tenure, usually they'll give you a certain amount of time, usually maybe a year, uh, to be able to essentially pack your stuff and get out. Right? You're basically fired. Uh, very rarely will they allow you to reapply for tenure. Instead, usually what happens is that they'll give you time to be able to find another academic position, uh, and then you're gone. My favorite professor, one of my favorites in undergrad, Department of Psychology, she was the best teacher and we loved her and everybody gave her amazing reviews and these things, but she just, you know, didn't fit in for whatever reason in the department and they rejected her tenure when I was there. And this was like devastating to her, I still remember. And then she got a job at another university and is thriving now. But oh my God, I was shocked and so were, I mean, she had grad students. And she got her thing rejected. Can you imagine then the grad students had to decide, do I get another supervisor, we came here to work with her, or do we follow her to another university? Uh, I mean, it was really wild. So, you know, tenure and the tenure clock is really serious business in academia. Um, obviously, when you do get tenure, there's going to be certain expectations on you. Yes, maybe you're not going to be as much of a workhorse on kind of smaller things, but, you know, maybe instead of being a lower level person on committees, you're going to, you know, take on responsibilities as the chair, or the co-chair of committees, or even of the department eventually. You're going to be pursuing larger grants, or you're going to supervise other faculty members, like colleagues in your department so they can get grants. Uh, you're going to be expected in terms of where you're published, at least the same level of impact or higher impact in terms of the article, the journals that you're publishing in. Uh, if you're working in a field that has like national associations, you're going to be expected to take on leadership roles. These are just things that are expected. Whether people actually say them or not is something different, but my job for you guys as always is to be able to just be real transparent so you know what's going on in academia, and it's an expectation. And finally, you get level three, which is being a full professor. Now, there's a, a number of things you should know about this. Obviously, you've already got tenure, right? Uh, some people consider being a full professor these days as just being an honorary title. It's almost like a lifetime achievement award or it's a formal recognition from your peers that you're at the highest level. Um, sometimes to be able to get full professor level, and sometimes this happens in tenure as well. When I got my tenured uh, full professorship in Norway, they did this as well. They, they literally solicit information like feedback from other leading people in the field to say like, you know, who is this guy? You know, is he influential? Does he deserve to be at this highest level? Uh, which is a nerve wracking process as you can imagine. But, you know, if you do get it, then it means that, wow, you know, people in, you know, your colleagues really respect you. It's almost like winning, you know, the Oscars, you know, an Academy Award for a film. And it's like, wow, what an honor that my peers, you know, uh, respect me and respect my work and think that I've made a, a major contribution. An important thing about becoming a full professor is that this is your final big pay bump, right? So when you went from grad student to postdoc, psh, postdoc to assistant, psh, assistant to associate, uh. And then finally, this is the highest level you're gonna get to. And the issue with this obviously is that, you know, once you get this big pay bump, unless you wanna go into administration, you wanna be, you get a little bit more money usually if you're an, assist, uh, an assistant or the chair of your department. Uh, of course, you can take on more classes to make more money in these things. But unless you wanna become like a provost or a dean or president of a university, I've had colleagues who they've taken that route. This is, this is the most money you're gonna make and there will be routine raises to be able to adjust for inflation, but it's not like you're gonna get like a 15% raise ever again in your academic career unless you jump universities. And I'll make another video about whether or not you should consider switching universities and the considerations you should take into, uh, into account, and I'll link that in the description below here. Uh, but it's important to recognize that this is like your last big pay bump.
okay? Also, obviously, this is the most prestigious uh, level you're going to get to, so if you've already hit this level, I just want to extend a congratulations, because it's a really big deal. And if you've applied and gotten it, again, huge congratulations. You know, I hope you're watching this video right after that, and uh, so that we can celebrate together. Message me down below, and I'll, uh, I'll have a beer in your honor. Uh, and finally, uh, one thing that I've been told time and again in terms of this this final bump, this happened with me, this has happened with a variety of colleagues of mine, when you're going from associate to full, one of the key things is having independent scholarship. And what I mean by that is like solo authorship on articles, right? Being a thought leader in your own right, doing entire studies only by yourself, you're the only author on the study, writing reviews, uh, thought leadership pieces. So for example, I did one on like, uh, what is it? Five Opportunities for Innovation was the name of the article in Violence Risk Assessment. I did a methodological primer on statistics to teach people statistics in my field. I've developed a variety of different statistics, you know, by myself and with colleagues but written papers on those, written letters to the editor, contributed in terms of being the guest editor of special issues of journals. If you wanna learn how to do that, I'll post a link to a video of exactly how to get that done uh, in the description below. But the importance of kind of the solo independent scholarship is critical. I had a colleague, one of the biggest named people in my field, he didn't get full professorship, right, a, when he applied. It made no sense. But one of the things that they mentioned was that he just didn't have enough solo publications. And for somebody of his stature, I, I was really shocked, right? Um, but, you know, that's something that you can reapply for. It's not like tenure, where you go for it once and then that's it. But it is an arduous process to do it. So some people decide, I went for it, I didn't get it, you know what, I, it's too stressful, I'm just not gonna do it. So that's being a full professor. All right, y'all, thank you so much for joining us. I wanna hear from you in the comments below. Did you have any misunderstandings about what an assistant, an associate, or a full professor is in terms of that academic ladder in North America? If you're from a different country, please do talk to us in the comments below. What does the system look like for you? Where are you in the system? What have you learned going through it? What do you think is some information that would be really worthwhile for your colleagues internationally to know if they're interested in maybe getting an academic position in your country? It would be so helpful to share, so please do that. And as always, if you have any suggestions for future episodes of Navigating Academia, please post them in the comments below and make sure to go through and give a thumbs up on any of those that you want me to make a video on and then I'll be more likely to do that. Don't forget to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, and with your students. Like us on social media and subscribe to our channel. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career coaching with me, send a session via the website below and let's talk about where you are in your career right now and how in the fastest and most effective way possible we can get you to the top and also make as much money as possible by leveraging the academic skills that you already have. All right, everybody, have a great day. I want you to remember to get out there, take chances, and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here, as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.